<laughs> All right. Is that like a mini boss in like a video I game? What, what are we doing I here? I failed. I apologize. Game four, Steph's heroics. Game three, Jalen's gallantry. Game two, Steph's dauntlessness. And game one, Al's audaciousness. That is how we got here. Game five tonight in San Francisco. Teams that win game five go on to win the quinquennial game 100% of the time. <laughs> How about starting here, National Paddle? Draymond on the bench in the fourth quarter. It worked Friday. Does Steve Kerr dare do it again? George, around the horn to you, the number one thing that you think will decide tonight's game five. Well, the one thing I've learned here is that you, Tony, have been in your thesaurus. Uh, dauntlessness, audaciousness. Was it not I mean, audacious at Al Horford at the game he had in game one? Yeah, well, listen, let's talk about how I think Steph Curry being selfish is I guess the best way to describe mm -hmm. it and I mean that in a positive way is the thing that I've learned will help the Warriors now that doesn't mean that he doesn't need help he can't score 110 by himself but I do think the more Steph Curry shoots and is more aggressive offensively the better it is for the Warriors in this series and that continues to be a trend but he does need help, as I mentioned. Andrew Wiggins, career high rebounds. He needs to do all those little things that maybe Draymond is struggling doing at the moment. Not to say that Draymond can't be a factor here, but I think Andrew Wiggins, this is part of the reason they have him on this roster because of his versatility. And then, of course, Klay Thompson, that drop coverage the Celtics played the last couple of games gave Clay an opportunity to light it up from three. He's become a lot more efficient from three-point land in the last couple of games. And you know what, Tony? In game five, historically, that's the best Clay three-point game. He averages 44% from three-point land in game five fives play. of the NBA Finals. Tim Callis will bring you in here, the one thing you think decides tonight. I don't, I don't know if learned is the right – way to go when you're saying I've learned that Steph Curry is better, a little better than Jason Tatum. We knew that for his mm -hmm. career he was, but, but the question coming in was where is Curry in his yeah. career, yeah. year 13 or so, and where is Tatum at 23 coming into his prime? And Steph's numbers, his shooting numbers, especially from the three-point line, have gone way up in this series. And, and that's the surprise to me that Boston, Boston's doing a lot of good things to disrupt uh, Golden State's passing game and the way they, their motion offense they're only getting, you know, 20, 22 assists in some of these games where they were getting up around 40 uh, against Dallas. But they're having a lot of trouble with Steph. Meanwhile, Tatum shooting under 30% when he's shooting two-pointers. He, when he gets into the lane and gets those shots, he's got to be over 50%. And, you know, the series is 2-2. Two -two. It could still happen, but it hasn't happened for him so far. Tower of Spain, one thing you expect to see tonight. Yeah, I'm not surprised about the focus on Steph because he was transcendent in that last game and the, the Warriors have absolutely no shot without Steph being great, being selfish, taking more shots, being as effective as he's been. But I think even in a game where Steph is fantastic, if the Celtics execute and don't make mistakes, they win. So to me, it's, it's as much about Steph as it is about the Celtics' turnovers. Everybody knows the statistic at this point. The up and down is 16. 16 plus, and they lose. 16 below that, and they usually win. So you can combine all of the other things that are a factor, of course. The Celtics have not been clutch in actual clutch minutes. You saw 35 missed shots combined for Smart Brown and Tatum in that game four. You saw how big a factor Looney was when he was able to come in. He's plus 36 now for the series while Draymond has stuttered. So there's all these factors that come into play, but if everything is the same and everybody's doing their best and the Celtics just don't turn the ball over and execute instead of getting loose with it down the stretch, I think they win. And Harry Lyles Jr. Yeah, I know a lot of the focus has been what can the Celtics defense do to stop Stephen Curry, but I think to Sarah's point, the important thing here is what the Celtics defense has done, particularly in the half court, to slow down this Golden State offense. I mean, I think the thing that is terrific about Golden State is, yes, you could have the flurry of Steph Curry or Klay Thompson's shots, but when their offense is flowing, you cannot stop it. It is the most unstoppable force in sports, and they've been able to do that. I think the one thing that you have to look at is Steph has 137 points this series on 50% shooting. The rest of the Golden State starters have 176 points on 39% shooting. I think if you're the Celtics, you take that. And this series has come down to all of the other role players in this series. For me, somebody to watch tonight is Robert Williams. It appeared he tweaked that knee at the end of the fourth mm -hmm. quarter there. 
in game four. He's been the most important piece, in my opinion, on this Celtics team, not because he's going to score the most points or anything like that, but he brings the most energy on both ends of the floor and helps this Celtics team keep a rhythm that when they have, Golden State hasn't been able to stop thus far. Dono back in. Tony, I understand Sarah and Harry's points, and, and they certainly make a ton of sense, and they're very valid. But here's the deal. At this stage of the series, everybody knows pretty much what the other team is doing. And, and if you look at Boston about the turnover, Sarah makes a great point. 16 is kind of the threshold for them. But everybody has been able to speed them up. The Nets did it even though they got swept. Milwaukee did it. Miami did it. And now Golden State has figured out how to speed them up. And that, to me, is something that I don't know if Boston – can, can withstand because they're just not confident when it comes to dribbling the basketball. George, you said everybody knows who the other team is. Do we even know where the Warriors are right now with Draymond Green? Could Steve Kerr dare put him on the bench again? Or did that motivate him? Yeah. What can you possibly expect from Draymond tonight? Uh, look, I think at home he'll play better. He's been – look, he's had a rough couple of games. I don't think there's any question. But I do think that we could see more of game two, Draymond. I think Draymond's biggest issue, Tony, is that he's cheating on defense. And the Celtics are the first team to actually make them – pay for that. I know that Jared Dudley, the Mavericks assistant coach in the last series when I was covering that series, told me we got to make Draymond pay when he cheats off his man. The Celtics have been able to do that. If Draymond just plays to the game plan on defense, he'll have a better game. Kyle Shaw. Yeah, they went on an 11-3 run when they initially took Draymond out. But, but, but Sedano's right. He, he brings a negative energy uh, on the road at home. The, fan, the Warrior fans love every, all his nonsense and everything he does, and that can actually fuel the team. It doesn't really fuel them, I don't think, on the road. Do you think it propels them to victory tonight, Tim Kalisha? I think the fuel propels them uh, to a win in this uh, almost a Game 7 that we're calling a Game we're 5. We're calling it a mini Game 7. Uh, Sarah, it seemed like you were leaning Boston. Mini Game 7. No, 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 no. I said those were what would need to happen. Because as important as Steph is, even if he's great, if Boston doesn't shoot themselves in the foot, they can win even when Steph's great. I'm not saying that that's going to happen because the Warriors have figured out how to force Boston to do a lot of the things that they don't want to do. In turn, to your point about Draymond, though, the Celtics have figured out how to turn Draymond's only option to be open shooting. And we don't want Draymond shooting if we're the Warriors. So that's why you have to start doing the offensive-defensive switches. I think Steve Kerr will use Looney a lot early and then use him again late the way that he did in Game 4. Well, when Draymond did come in, he got the majority of his rebounds and assists during that stretch after he was benched. So he came in and he was efficient in the things that he does well instead of being a little bit more, you know, attempting to get that energy with things that he can't do well, like open shots. So in the 30-for-30 30 30 on this one game tonight, who do you have, Sarah? <laughs> The Warriors. <laughs> Harry Lyles Jr., who you got? I'm going with the Warriors because of Kerr's ability to do something like bench a Draymond Green. And then when you have Kevon Looney come in the game, he has been rebounding 37.5% of their missed shots mm. on offense. That's And huge. George Sedano. Warriors. Thank you, George. We move on to what the Yankees did to the Chicago Cubs this weekend. They beat them 28 to five. A small ball win in extras, solo home run game on Saturday. A complete mash party yesterday that ended with the player with the lowest OPS in the entire league hitting a home run off of a position player on a 35 mile per hour pitch. Slowest pitch ever to be hit for a home run in recorded history, they said. New York 44 and 16 through 60 games. That's a top 10 start in the history of the game, Tim. What are we seeing from the Yankees so far? What we're seeing is a reminder to me of those 98 Yankees, the team that started three straight, a run of three straight World Series victories, a uh, team that won 114 games. I don't know if this team will get there. They're on pace to do better. Uh, they're on pace certainly to hit more home runs. But really, for me, the thing that's, that's just wiping out other teams is their five-man rotation, and every one of them is delivering. People hadn't even heard – some people hadn't even heard of Nestor Cortez at the start of the season. Uh, Tyon is finally pitching like the prospect he's been, all the rest of them. They're just too dominant in every phase. Sarah Spain, you got an up-close look at the Yankees this week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you Yeah, see? you're welcome, Yankees. We really helped you buoy <laughs> up those stats and really feel good about yourselves against a team that's not competing to win this year. I think Frank the Tank's magic was in his pitch. Even, even when he's pitching, mm -hmm. he still makes home runs happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's been 
amazing to watch. And I think with Kalashaw, it's obviously their pitching's been a huge part of it. Some of the defensive changes that they made because of things like retaining Anthony Rizzo. But I do want to see how this translates in the next stretch against better teams. Of the seven teams that have won at least 42 of their first 60 games, only three have gone on to win it all. We know mm. how a second half swoon can happen. We know how the postseason looks different. So when it's the Yankees, the only thing that matters is winning it all at this point. So this is all well and good, but let's see how they So there's a little the pause from Sarah. And if we were to compare them to the, the ancient history team of 1998, 25 years ago or so, Harry, do you feel the same way about this team? <laughs> it certainly has a similar feel. And honestly, it's a little uncomfortable for me Was as Harry somebody, born? full disclosure, an Atlanta <laughs> Braves fan. 1998 was not a good year for six-year-old me. Uh, 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 but I will say this. The thing that, I, that is incredible to me about this team is that they've just put themselves in a position where even if they finish 500 the rest of the year, they're still going to win 95 games. And the other fun part about this, too, is Aaron Judge, 24 home yeah, runs. Yeah, yeah. He's on pace to hit 66. I think a lot of people still feel like Roger Maris' 61 is still the mark, right, that mm -hmm. we're all under the assumption that he was the last one to do it clean. The fact that he is on his own little home run chase here is, is one of the most fun, to part, part, fun parts about this to me. And George Sedano. Tony, the Yankees have figured out how to win baseball games in 2022, which is you hit home runs and you give up less home runs or way less home runs. They have a home run differential of plus 50. They've hit 98. They've only given up 48. And if you think about it, they've won 44 games this season, all right? 44 of the first 60. Three of the last four teams to do that have won the World Series, except for, I'm sorry, Mina Kimes, your Seattle Mariners back in 2001. Mm -hmm. But more so, the Yankees, the last four times they've had the lead as far as wins are concerned through 60 games, they've won the World yeah, Series. Yeah, but that's and ancient this... history, George. I mean, we just said Wait, Harry, wait, wait, was... wait. Yes. I was just going to say that they're doing this despite Garrett Cole not necessarily having a great season. His ERA is 363. He's not great as far as strikeouts per nine Number innings. Five the most he's had in five years. Right I understand what you're saying, yeah. but uh, the idea that they're hitting home runs. Well, they hit 2018 as recently. They hit more home runs than anybody. And but they're not giving the up as many. Right, it's the pitching. Last word, Tim Kalashaw. I just wanted to say to Harry Lyles, six-year-old me in New Providence, New Jersey, kind of enjoyed the 61 Yankees. <laughs> what are you doing on this okay. show? Six years Last old word. in 98. Higgy, get out of Higgy here. Higgy hit the home run off Schwindel. Again, that's a 30. Uh, one more than someone else. Uh, that gave me a little bit of extra incentive today. Ooh, that's Rory McIlroy. After winning the PGA Tours RBC Open in the face of Greg Norman, that's who he's talking about, one more win, who's running the LIV Tour. And on the LIB tour, Phil Mickelson, first public comments today. In regards to if fans would leave or whatnot, I, I respect and I understand their opinions. I have the utmost respect for the players on PGA Tour. I would say to everyone that um, has lost loved ones, lost friends of 9-11, that I have deep, deep empathy for them. As you see, Phil in front of the background for the USGA because the U.S. Open this week. So the LIV Tour and the PGA Tour guys are going to be playing together this week. George Sedano, what are you buying? What are you selling? Uh, I'm buying Rory. I love the enthusiasm that he has for the PGA Tour and his victory. I'm still selling Phil. Tony, this reminds me of these awkward moments when uh, a family member, like, they get divorced and they bring their significant others, their new significant others for the first time at a family event. It just feels awkward like that right now. Kalisha? You know, I I'm buying Rory as well and the shot he took at Greg Norman. I like that. I'm selling on all these guys who left. This idea that they all say this is a way to grow the game of golf. No, this is a way to damage the game of golf. The PGA Tour is diminished because it's losing some good names, even if some of them are over the hill. And nobody cares about this weak Facebook tour that where they're all making all their money. So that's not going to grow the game of golf. It grows their bank accounts. That's the end of the story. Well, let me ask a follow-up then, because this is Phil's first public comments in months, right? And for him to come out today and answer the questions the way he did, how did it land for you, Tim? For, uh, better than the Europeans and Graham McDowell and Ian Poulter and the stuff they said. But still, Phil's only option, best option is to play and to smile and hit some of his shots. And some of his fans who love watching him will like that. There's nothing he can say that's going to There's nothing, gonna right. So, so that's what, what I'm trying to figure out here. Is there a path right. for him to reclaim his legacy much. or however you would phrase it? Sarah Spain, I'll bring you in here. 
Yeah, I would say the path is maybe time because we have a tendency to rewrite the severity of things the further away from them we get. So if we can presume that maybe people will start talking about Jamal Khashoggi and other things like that differently, the further distance we put between it, maybe that. It was better than saying, I play golf, I'm not smart, I hit ball with stick, which some other players tried to get away with. So at least he sort of addressed it. Right. But it is empty because we all know the reasoning behind why they're playing. But, but Sarah, if he were to come out and say, you know what, when I talked four months ago, I thought I was off the record. But beyond that, I was really talking. Out. I had no, I didn't do my, my research. I didn't, I didn't know what I was saying. And I, I spoke very, very poorly. And now we can all agree golf is golf. And the U.S. government might, makes arrangements it, with Saudi Arabia. Right now, the president's doing a, a business and, and gas price and all these things. If he would have said that, would that be enough for you to, to view him differently? It might help to acknowledge what he said before, but then what he's saying is, and now I have done the research and looked into it, and I'm still making the decision I'm making. So that criticism will still remain. I, I mean, I think people criticized him for not having empathy, and he was trying to... I mean, do we really need to ask Harry Lyles, Phil, if he has empathy for people who have lost people in some sort of war, some sort of human rights? Do we need that out of our golfer? Go ahead, Harry. I think it's a fair question to ask, but I, I think, you know, your actions speak louder than your words, and that's why I'm kind of selling his comments because, again, what he's saying and what he's doing are two totally different things. However, I am buying Rory uh, as the petty weight champ with a lot of the business casual mm -hmm. trash talk that we've seen because I think he's being a voice for the PGA Tour that people should want to be seeing out of Jay Monahan, and we haven't seen that thus far. So to me, I, I think what Rory is kind of punching back at here uh, has a little bit more substance than what Phil's doing. We'll move on. Buy or sell two. Super regional, super shocker. Notre Dame taking out Tennessee. So the number one overall in college baseball. Fired on all cylinders all year, but at home going out. Tim Kalisha, what do you buy? What do you sell as we approach the College World Series here? I'm buying. I don't really know why number one seeded teams never win the College World Series. They haven't done it since Miami in the last century. Other than the fact that baseball is baseball, pitchers matter, and the number eight team is pretty much about as good as the number one team, where that's not true when the number one team is Alabama in football. There were some great series over the weekend. Mississippi uh, shutting out twice. Uh, Southern Miss was great, but uh, there's more to come. Spain. Yeah, well, it's unique. It's the first time since the seeding in 99, since you've had three straight years without the number one making it. To Tim's point, it's not that clear. 11 of the last 17 since 2004 haven't even been nationally seeded at all, not to mention number one seeded, so you can win it from anywhere. Harry? To Sarah's point, this is why I'm buying Notre Dame. It's much about more about what they did and how they did it. They were down 3-1 in the seventh inning. Ryan LaManna had one home run all season and then hits the two-run bomb to tie it, and then the follow-up batter gives them the lead. To me, that was just great. Coach Dano. Tony, I'll take it back even further from Harry. They lost 12-4 to against the number one seed in game two. They could have packed it in, and in that seventh inning, you could see the emotion when they took the lead at 4-3. to it was